If you have access to the internet, you more than likely have heard the name Jordan Peterson. He's in the media practically every day of the week, spreading vile and disgusting advice, trying to ruin the world, spread violence, and hurt as many people as he can every single time he opens his mouth. Well, that's what picture the mainstream media like to paint anyway. Despite all the helpful advice Professor Peterson gives out for free via his YouTube channel, his blog, and the various speaking gigs he attends, for some reason people are forever out to take him down. And with the recent banning of sales for his book over in New Zealand following the inconceivable and downright horrible attacks that occurred upon innocent folk attending a mosque, coupled with various other ridiculous decisions that are made by, in quotes, those in charge, without any actual evidence or reason for doing so, including the denial for a New York Times bestseller title after more than 3 million copies being sold, something strange is going on. Why so much hate? I can understand if Peterson was going around screaming, yelling, and abusing people. I can also understand if he wasn't wrapped up in an insanely busy schedule, flying all over the world to improve his thinking on certain topics, as well as help as many people as possible. But this is not the case. The hate directed at him and those that find his thoughts and advice helpful comes unwarranted, not to mention laced with a whole lot of confusion for what he is actually trying to achieve. Because of this, Peterson is shunned, his book is banned, his views disregarded, and he is forever battling the barrage of hit pieces that are recycled, rehashed, and posted to any number of websites that is seeking virality rather than integrity. Identity politics, the root cause of so many terrible events in our history, from World War II to mass genocides, narrowing humans down to one characteristic is one of the worst games that we can play. It not only segregates so many individuals, but it also results in a constant battle between the very people that we share the earth with. What is the point? Why are so many people fixated on condemning their own species because of what they look like, what their sexual orientation is, or what religion they follow? Do we need aliens to show up from the vast reaches of space to pull us all into line? How can we, as a collective of humans, not see that there is a problem here? And how can things consistently be escalating? At the end of the day, it's a disgrace that the focus on one or two characteristics like these can result in people loving or despising you. You can be a regular person, someone that does their best, tries to help out when they can, tries to be thoughtful and respectful of their neighbour, yet because of their skin colour, they're silenced, they're labelled a bigot, they're told that their opinion doesn't matter. Why play this game? Perhaps it's just for power, control, manipulation and fear. But when the only thing that matters about you is what race or gender you are, who you're sexually attracted to, or what religion you follow, and everything else in your life like your family, friends, job, what you do in your spare time, what you're studying, what impact you have in your community, what kind of person you are overall, just to name a few, does not matter, then surely we are not thinking properly. Furthermore, what about the disruption to lives when so much focus is placed on these characteristics and thus forces people to be boxed into one sole category? For example, in this line of thinking, if you follow a certain religion, you are immediately attributed to a certain way of thinking and a certain way of life. This is a simplistic and unfair interpretation of individuals. True, there are radicals in every sector, but for the majority of the time, people are not made up of just one or two characteristics. They are a wide range of things. They also just want to live their life. They don't want to be boxed in or assumed to be a certain way simply because of a couple of characteristics that are blown up by the media and society. It's insulting. Moreover, treating someone differently just because they fall into a category can be frustrating to say the least. I mean, who wants to be told to shut up or contrastingly cotton wooled all the time anyway? Peterson has spoken extensively about how identity politics can lead us all down a dark road. The very dark road that we can read in our history books. For him to be labelled someone that is against wrapping this whole identity politics debacle up as quick as possible is simply a misunderstanding of his work. Furthermore, he has stated countless times since the fight with the Canadian government regarding Bill C-16 that his issues were never with folk preferring to be addressed by a certain pronoun, but instead with the government's attempt at controlling society's speech. Speaking of speech, free speech is something Peterson is labelled as somebody who is against it. But this logic doesn't make any sense. His fight against the introduction of Bill C-16 is what brought him to the front of the media's limelight, and it is exactly an indication of how pro-free speech he is. If he wasn't, would it make sense for him to battle a law that would compel individuals to speak a certain way? Free speech is meant to be just that, free. It allows for thoughts to come into fruition through the spoken word. It allows for them to then be analysed, criticised, and if need be, condemned. 
That's the whole point of free speech. It allows us to voice our opinions, providing us with a chance to either realize we do or we don't agree with what we're saying. Moreover, those around us are also given the ability to do the same. But with a law on how we speak, we can't shape ourselves and the world to what is best for all of us. And this leads to tyranny. A tyranny that would kill you or at the very least cut your tongue out for speaking bad or against your overlords. Is this what direction we want to head in? Of course not. Nobody wants tyranny. And if we're real about it, we've all said things that we wish we hadn't. We've all said things that we wish we could retract or realize that we don't agree with. What good would it be to be fired from our job, chastised, abandoned, locked away, and left without a chance for redemption just by an unintentional slip of the tongue? This is exactly why Peterson constantly preaches free speech and truth over everything. He believes that all truth, regardless of the time or energy that it might take, leads to good. Whether it be a truth that hurts somebody or society in the short term, or a truth that provides instant and positive reinforcement, all truths lead to the exact outcome that we all need for growth. For without truth, we just have lies, we just have deception, and we just have chaos. This is in fact chapter 8 in Peterson's 12 Rules for Life book. If you bend everything totally, blindly, and willfully towards the attainment of a goal, and only that goal, you will never be able to discover if another goal would serve you and the world better. It is this that you sacrifice if you do not tell the truth. If, instead, you tell the truth, your values transform as you progress. If you allow yourself to be informed by the reality manifesting itself, as you struggle forward, your notions of what is important will change. You will reorient yourself, sometimes gradually and sometimes suddenly and radically. Who can we blame for all this misconstruing? Primarily, it seems that we can point our fingers at the media for causing this distortion of Peterson's core message. The very industry that chooses to pull one thing from something he has said and blow it all out of proportion, not in the name of providing the public with untainted information, but only in the name of popularity, i.e. to go viral, to incite the most clicks, to enhance interaction to boost ad revenue or social media following. Don't worry about providing us with the entire story. Only pick and choose what you wish to bend the truth to what agenda you wish to promote. It's an odd thought that with the hundreds of hours Peterson has uploaded to YouTube alone that are filled with valuable information that has been spoken in front of thousands of people, that the media still prefers to force feed society with biased content that leans to one side of the political fence. There's no bigger picture here, just micronized content that is warped to an agenda. If people simply gave him a chance and gave, say, his biblical series of viewing, however, they would witness logical sound advice and information brought to them in an interesting way that has the power to even bring an atheist back to agnosticism. But, unfortunately, those that despise Peterson keep their blinkers up, their ears covered, and in denial about how a professor and clinical psychologist of more than 30 years, that has both taught hundreds of students and helped hundreds of patients, all while selling more than 3 million copies of his book, and helped thousands upon thousands of people all over the world, could be logical. To finish things off in this video, I just want to show you a few clips of Peterson in action, in his element if you will. One of the following videos is of him speaking during his biblical lectures in front of hundreds of people, a series that has been watched by millions. Another is of him doing his best to excite, motivate and educate students. And the last is of him telling a story of an almost daily interaction he has. While many people are opposed to Professor Peterson, I believe that a lot of the hate and resistance against him can be attributed to only listening to one side of the story, i.e. a biased and warped story that is created by the media. We all know how potent the media is for channeling what we, the public, know about the world. We all know of stories that don't come into popular circulation simply because they don't align with what story they or the government wish to tell, or do not pull enough heartstrings. True, Peterson isn't perfect, but who is? Moreover, he is influencing people all over the world for the better, to sort themselves out, to speak truthfully, to take responsibility for their own actions. And at the end of the day, where is the wrong in that? You know, Dostoevsky, who is a very crazy person, partly because of his epilepsy, he said, a man is not only responsible for everything he does, but for everything that everyone else does. And you think, well, no. <laughs> no. No. And yes, sometimes no. Sometimes that's what you think if you're cataclysmic, 
cataclysmically depressed, right? Is that your sins are so egregious that, that they're unforgivable and that in some manner you're at, res- you're at fault for everything that's terrible with the world. But there's actually truth in that and there's actually redemptive truth in that is that things wouldn't be so bad if you weren't so if you weren't so far from what you could be. And that's terribly pessimistic because it's all on you, man. But it's terribly optimistic because, God, there's a lot of things that you could do. And if you're crying out for something to do, then that's the best news you could possibly have. It's like, things aren't so good, but neither are you. So (laughs) if you stop doing the things that you knew to be destructive, which is the right place to start, you know, if you're going to clean up your room, what do you do first? Well, you just get rid of the mess. You know, and you know what, no, no one has to come in and tell you, hopefully, what's the worst mess. It's just it announces itself to you. And you can certainly know yourself, and this is a very easy meditative exercise, to sit down and think, okay, I'm doing one thing really stupidly that I should stop doing. It's like, how long is it going to take you to figure out what that is? It's about two seconds, right? You've known it forever. And you could even make it less demanding. You could say, there are some stupid things that I'm doing that I know are stupid and wrong, that I could stop doing, that I would stop doing. And then you can just start with that. And you can just do that, and maybe it's just a little thing, although it's not, because it's a, it's a step forward on the proper voyage. It's not a small thing. And you think, well, what would happen? You could say, let's do this for a year or even a month. Just try not to do things you know to be stupid and wrong for a month. And that means not to say things you know to be stupid and wrong as well. Maybe that's the most important thing. Just do it as an experiment. See what happens. And it's so fun because I have people writing to me from all over the world who are saying they're doing that. They're saying, well, you know, I cleaned up my room and and then I stopped saying stupid things and, my God, it's like, things are way better. It's like, (laughs) who would have guessed it? You know? And so, it's low-hanging fruit, man. Because that's the other thing. If there's a lot of things wrong with you, then it's, it's really easy to start fixing it, you know? you got so much, there's so much territory that you can inhabit. This song I find quite interesting, so I'm going to take it apart quite a bit. Um, in some sense, I feel foolish doing it because it's, you know, it's a, it's a childish, it's a childish song in some ways. But... But that's okay. When you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Well, okay. There's some mysteries there. People wish upon stars. That's like a little ritual, right? Why do they do that? Well, and what exactly is a star? That's another question, because... There are stars that shine in the heavens, and there are people who are stars. And so, why are people stars? Well, they're usually famous people, right? They're people that, who attract a lot of attention. And maybe they're people who have a lot of talent, that's another possibility. Um, maybe they're models. I don't mean, you know, clothing models, although sometimes they are, but they're models for emulation. That's what being a star means. That's why People Magazine is full of stars. It's like they're, they're like they're like heroes brought to Earth. And of course, you know nothing about them. All you know is their public persona. And of course, they're usually very attractive. And so that allows you to project upon them all the things that would go along with ideal humanity. And so they're stars. And, but still, why stars? Well, stars beckon in the darkness, right? Well, to wish upon a star is to raise your eyes above the horizon and to focus on something transcendent that's beyond you to focus on the absolute, we could say, to focus on the light that shines in the darkness So here's a story, I love this story, man, it just killed me I was in LA at the Orpheum and you know it's rough downtown in LA and places around the Orpheum too and Tammy and I, my wife, um, because she's traveling with me and is a big help, by the way um, we were wandering around downtown LA the morning after the talk, and uh, we were walking down the street, and we were on streets we probably shouldn't have been on, but any, in any case, because what the hell do we know, being stupid Canadians? And so, we were walking down the street, and this car pulled up beside us, and this kid hopped out, and this good-looking Latino kid, 20, 21, something like that, he jumped over, and he said, uh, he's all excited, he said, are you Dr. Peterson? I said, yeah, yeah, and he said, 
I'm really, really happy to meet you. Um, I've been watching your lectures for like a year and a half, and uh, I've been trying to put my life together, and it's really working. I'm really doing way better. I really wanted to thank you. And so it's lovely, eh, when you're walking down a kind of rough area, and somebody pulls up beside you, and they jump out of the car to tell you how much better their life is. That's a pretty good morning. And so, but then that isn't all that happened. <clears throat> he ran back to his car. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He went back to his car, and he got out his dad, and they came over together, and... His dad was just smiling away, like a real smile, you know. And so was the kid, and they had their arms around each other, and they said, look, like, we've really been working on our relationship for the last year and a half, and it's going just great. We want to thank you. And the father said something like, I'm really happy that you got my son back to me. It's like, yes, that's what this bloody tour has been like. It's great. And everybody that's coming to these talks, that's what they're trying to do. You know, I got 3,000 people in each audience, and what they're trying to do is figure out how can I take maximal responsibility for my own life? How can I imbue it with the meaning that helps me withstand tragedy and suffering? How can I be a better person? And wouldn't it be great if that was of optimal benefit to my family and the community? You're getting very emotional about this. Well, it's something, Joe. Jesus, I've no. seen like 150,000 people in the last two months. You know, and this is what it's... Well, you'll have a chance to talk to Ruben about this too. This is what it's been like. It's so positive. I can't believe it. And it's just one person after another saying, like, look, I was, I was having a rough time. I'm really happy that I've been encountering what you've been talking about. I've really been trying to put things together, and it's really helping. 